A few people messaged me asking about the free will debate, which has been going on here on YouTube for a year or more, and I didn't really know what to say about it at first because I try to always focus my videos on unknown information, which is actually going to help people. But finally, I recognized one important thing that everyone misses about the free will debate, which does make a big difference in your life if you recognize it. And in this way, the free will debate relates to a lot of other philosophical debates and also to politics and conspiracy theories. So if you're not particularly interested in the free will debate, skip forward in this video. As far as the free will debate, the one thing I wanted to point out is it's kind of an old debate. It's uh, interesting to see that particularly the atheist community has picked up on what used to be a religious philosophical debate. The religious philosophers used to try to prove that there was no free will with a religious proof, which today we refute. The religious proof goes that everyone knows there's an omniscient God, and an omniscient being has to know the future, therefore there is a predestined future, therefore you have no free will because everything is predestined. Today, everyone can refute that pretty easily. But the atheist and scientific community nowadays, the people that try to disprove free will, they do exactly the same thing. They start with an assumption that uh, is unprovable. And the assumption is never really stated, but this is the assumption. The assumption is that consciousness is a product of matter. Therefore, since all matter in the universe is in a certain arrangement, it's logical, it's a logical argument that uh, everything in the universe flows forward in a predestined manner, predetermined manner, and there's really no such thing as free will. But that whole argument is premised on the assumption that consciousness is a product of matter. I did a whole video on this in the past called Consciousness, Quantum Physics, and Suffering. Uh, if you're really strict about it scientifically, there's absolutely no proof that consciousness is a product of matter. The only thing you can really prove is that consciousness and matter are intertwined. And let me go over it again because there was a lot of discussion and argument about it in, in the comment section of the last video. A lot of people try to prove that consciousness is a product of matter by saying, well, this or that neurochemical affects your state of consciousness. All these arguments basically boil down to is saying that uh, someone can pick up a rock and hit you in the head with it and affect your state of consciousness. Likewise, you can make a conscious decision to pick up a rock and move it or crush the rock. Those aren't proofs that consciousness creates matter or that matter creates consciousness. Those are just proofs that matter and consciousness are intertwined. There is no proof scientifically that matter creates consciousness. There are some scientists that argue on a quantum level that uh, consciousness creates matter, but even that's uh, still up for debate. The only thing you can really say strictly scientifically is that matter and consciousness are intertwined. But since we live in a material universe, it's our perspective that matter must be creating consciousness. We used to do the same thing with energy. We used to assume that matter was creating energy. And then as science evolved, we found that actually matter and energy are the same thing. And it's probably more correct to say that matter is a congealed form of energy. So today, the only known entities in the universe are matter slash energy and consciousness. And we do the same thing. We assume that consciousness must be a product of matter slash energy, whereas we may find one day that uh, consciousness and matter are two entirely separate entities with no no common uh, commonality, or we may find that uh, matter is a product of consciousness or the other way around. But right now, you can't really say anything with certainty, and so the proof that uh, there is no free will because consciousness is a product of matter it's based on an invalid assumption. In fact, even if you accept that assumption, you could still argue about the free will debate by uh, the many worlds uh, hypothesis in quantum physics, which says that there's no one particular predestined future, but there's an infinite number of potential universes uh, which exist in parallel. So the free will debate, the only thing that I feel I can prove about it is that it's an unprovable debate. There are two variables in the equation of free will, consciousness and matter. Consciousness is completely unknown to science. It's an unknown variable. And I think you could argue that matter is only partially understood by science. So you've got an equation with two variables, one of which is completely unknown, the other of which is partially known. You can never solve that equation. It's an unsolvable debate. The second thing I wanted to point out about the free will debate is that it's a meaningless debate. Uh, even people who are convinced that they've proven to themselves that there is no free will, those people always act as if there is free will. So no matter what you think you've proven about the free will debate, it's meaningless because you're going to continue to act as if there is free will. So that's my main point about the free will debate. I think I can prove that it's unprovable and meaningless. I can't prove anything else about it. I can give my opinion just like everyone else does, 
my opinion, based on my perspective, is that there is free will, but that it's greatly constrained by matter and by the past actions of your free will. But I can't prove that any more than anyone else can prove their perspective on free will. All I can prove is that it's a meaningless debate and it's an unprovable debate. Which brings me to the really important point of this video. The free will debate is possibly one of the more high-minded debates that goes on here on YouTube, and so I thought it was a good starting point to illustrate this really important issue. Um, to be an intellectual, I think, or just to think for yourself in general, takes a good deal of courage. Um, it's a lot easier just to believe whatever you want and to ignore the facts, and I think that's maybe what the majority of people do a lot of the time. Just like a top prize fighter who never backs down from a fight and is always courageous, I think really successful intellectuals have to always look at what the facts are telling them and, and never back down from, from what they see occurring. But there is one thing that uh, people still do. A top prize fighter, for example, may never back down from a fight, but they kind of shy away from the more difficult opponents, either consciously or subconsciously. And intellectuals and everyone else uh, also does this to varying degrees. Look at the debates that go on on YouTube here. As I said, the free will debate is probably one of the more high-minded debates. Uh, there's also a, a, a continual stream of videos arguing about evolution versus creationism. Numerous conspiracy theory videos, a lot of political videos, and this kind of mirrors what people talk about in, in regular life. When you look at almost all of these issues, they're just like the free will debate, uh, often unprovable and generally meaningless. And why do people discuss this kind of stuff? Because it's easy. Now, I don't mean to be too harsh about this, and I'm certainly more guilty of it than almost anybody else in the past in my personal life. And I know it's interesting and fun sometimes to discuss easy issues. But if the majority of your intellectual effort is focused on things which are unimportant or unprovable, sometimes it might be worthwhile to stop and ask yourself, what are you avoiding thinking about? I mean, look at the debates on YouTube. Uh, evolutionism versus creationism. P.J. O'Rourke called this kind of thing shooting dairy cows with a high-powered rifle. Is that really the most difficult opponent you can take on? If it is, you're far behind the times as far as science is concerned. Even the, the philosophical debates, when you really get into most of them, they boil down to perspective and, and to understanding consciousness. And ultimately, trying to understand consciousness with the intellect, you're going to just be treading water. You can only understand consciousness, in my opinion, through direct experience. So a lot of these higher philosophical debates boil down to simply arguing about perspective, where there's no winner and loser in the debate, and there's nothing really at stake anyway. Then there's conspiracy theories. Look at the vast majority of the conspiracy theories. Unprovable, otherwise they wouldn't be conspiracy theories. And generally, unimportant. No way you can react to it. Nothing you can do to modify your lifestyle to, to adjust to the conspiracy theory. People are just discussing these things for fun to avoid dealing with more difficult issues that they could adjust to. And even politics. I know people are going to argue about this, but look at 98% of the political discussion. It's about what the government should do, in theory. Unless Obama's waiting to take your call, you're never going to know whether your solution is going to work in the first place. And it's not really a solution because you don't have as part of your solution, a plan for its implementation. A true solution includes a plan for its implementation which you have enough energy and time to implement. So for most people, I believe that true political solutions are generally grassroots. If you have some plan that the federal government needs to implement, then part of your solution has to be how you're going to form a political action committee and get laws adopted at the federal level. Otherwise, it's not a solution, and not many people seem to recognize that. Now, I know it's still fun and useful to discuss uh, political issues and form consensus, and that there is some value to that, especially if you're one of the tiny minority of people who actually makes original points and speaks to a larger audience and isn't speaking in an echo chamber the way most uh, political pundits are speaking. It may seem like a mundane, simple point to show that much, if not most, of your intellectual discussion is meaningless and unimportant. But if you can really grasp that, you can make an enormous difference in your life. You can start focusing on things that are even more difficult to understand, but that actually have some importance. So let me just throw out a half dozen examples for you to consider. 
A really simple one is the economic system that you operate under. You probably work 40 hours a week. Wouldn't it be nice to understand how our economy truly functions and be able to adapt to it? Uh, this is something that very few intellectuals really consider. And I think the reason they don't consider it is that they subconsciously suspect that it's a, an oppressive, parasitic system. And believe me, if you really understand how our economic system works, how central banking works, it's more horrifying than you could ever imagine. It's really depressing at first. But once you understand it, you can adapt to it. Okay, maybe economics is not your cup of tea. Here's another one, peak oil. Talk about a depressing topic. When you first start to learn about peak oil, not very pleasant to think about some of the possibilities, but an incredibly challenging intellectual topic. Uh, you could study peak oil, I think, for a thousand hours and still not arrive at any definite consensus. It involves geology, engineering, politics, sociology, an amazingly complex topic, and some of the top people discussing peak oil are really brilliant people, in my opinion. But it's not, again, not something that most intellectuals get into for whatever reason, maybe because it's not a pleasant topic. And also because, again, once you understand it, it kind of urges you to take some action. And people would rather discuss something meaningless where they don't have to take action. All right, maybe you don't like peak oil or economics. Here's a difficult topic for you. Diet and health. To really understand diet and health, I think you could spend a lifetime and not not have a complete grasp of it. It's an amazingly complex topic, really challenging and fun to learn about, and yet most intellectuals completely ignore it. Why? Because once you understand diet, then suddenly you're faced with the fact that half the food you eat is really unhealthy and you should probably do something about it. Much more fun to discuss some meaningless conspiracy theory than something that would actually make a difference in your life. Maybe all those topics are a little too technical and you prefer something else. Here's an incredibly difficult topic and nothing could be more relevant to you. How can you improve your life? Believe it or not, a lot of intellectuals never really seem to give much thought to that one. First of all, it involves facing the fact that you have a problem in your life. Nobody really likes to face the big problems in their life. And then to devote a lot of thought to how to fix it, and then that means you have to actually do something rather than just sit and talk all day. That's an incredibly difficult topic, both to face in the first place and to find workable solutions. And if you don't like that one, here's an even more difficult one. How can you improve society? And I don't mean a cop-out like what the government should do in theory, which will never get implemented because your solution didn't have a plan of implementation. I mean a real solution of how you can improve society, which you actually have enough energy to carry out yourself and prove whether or not it works. There's a really difficult topic for you. And I know the point of this video seems very mundane, but if you think about it, it's one of the most important things you can ever grasp in life if you really internalize it. Because as someone who thinks for yourself, you have an enormous potential to improve your life and to even improve the world around you if you just have the courage to focus.